few years ago, a homeless man named Hunter began uploading very graphic self-surgery videos showing him attempting to remove a tumour that he couldn't afford treatment for, among other procedures. Naturally, many people were alarmed and concerned, but unbeknownst to most of them, Hunter had been concealing a dark past that had led to his rapid deterioration. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Kofi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will contain discussions of topics that some might find triggering, including self-surgery and homelessness. Viewer discretion is advised. You can become a Kofi member to watch an uncut version of this video, which features extra details that were unsuitable for this cut. Hunter Hogan uploaded his first couple of YouTube videos in September 2008, proposing the solution to the mortgage crisis at the time. His next upload, 10 years later, was quite the shift in tone, titled Disabled Homeless Man Robbed While Sleeping, Again. That disabled man was him, and the video showed his face this time, looking tired and dishevelled, as he explained he'd been sleeping next to a bench and someone had stolen the yoghurt and drink he'd bought the night before. Although his worrying circumstances seemed to improved a little over the next few years, as most of his videos were filmed inside after this, even though he remained homeless, his mental and physical health evidently deteriorated. In November 2020, he posted a number of extremely graphic videos on his website and on YouTube, though these are all now available to members only. The video showed various attempts at self-surgery, with Hunter trying to cauterise lesions on his knee, remove moles with a scalpel, and most concerningly, cut open a tumour on his chest before sloppily stitching it back together. The tumour appeared to be around 10 to 15 centimetres wide, and he can be heard groaning in pain when he slices into it with a scalpel. It's literally pouring with blood, and he manages to remove something, though I don't know if it's part of the tumour or what. I think he intended to remove the whole thing, but he gives up and decides to use four stitches to hold the large incision closed, without much success. This is really disturbing to watch, and I wouldn't recommend finding the videos unless you have a very strong stomach. It's honestly surprising the wound didn't get seriously infected, he stated that he sterilised the scalpel with a flame and had it sitting in alcohol, but his DIY surgery room is hardly likely to be sufficiently sterile. I have no idea how he managed to deal with the pain either. He put some kind of cream on it before his first attempt, which could have been to numb the skin, but judging by his reactions, I don't think it helped much. So what on earth possessed him to do this? According to the caption on his website, Due to disability, I am homeless, hungry, and in need of medications to cope with my medical problems. These videos of self-surgery are the result of my poverty and wouldn't have occurred if I had the sufficient financial support. Of course, it's absolutely tragic that he can't afford proper healthcare, and I don't think I'll ever complain about the NHS ever again after witnessing these videos. However, it's not totally clear whether these attempts at self-surgery were necessary or even beneficial in any way. The tumour actually appears to be a lipoma. Hunter acknowledges this himself, and lipomas are usually harmless and don't need any treatment. In fact, I have seen a few comments online from people claiming that Hunter stated that he actually did visit a doctor about this at one point, who told him that the lipoma did not need treatment. Though I couldn't find the video where he mentions this, so I can't personally confirm. As for the moles, I'm not even sure if one of them is a mole, as it looks more like a spot. 
Obviously, I'm not a doctor, but I don't see any reason why these moles would need to be removed. They're tiny and don't appear to have any of the characteristics of melanoma, so he's likely to cause more harm than good by messing with them unnecessarily. Hunter does suffer with mental health problems. He mentions panic disorder, generalised anxiety disorder, depression and PTSD, though it seems he might have self-diagnosed that. Either way, these problems may be even more extensive than he acknowledges, and this could be causing him to perform these seemingly unnecessary surgeries on himself. It might be worth noting that a few years ago on his Reddit account, he was a relatively active member on the Popping subreddit, which is mostly for sharing videos of popping spots and abscesses. He would share such videos and caption them with words like satisfying, so even though he was clearly in pain when he was removing these moles, I wonder if he also found it satisfying in an odd way too. Alternatively, he acknowledged that people get some enjoyment out of these graphic videos, so it could be a way of gaining more donations. Or maybe he's just trying to prove a point. He often talks about the system failing people like him, so perhaps the videos are a publicity stunt to inspire change. Regardless of the reasons behind these self-surgeries, or whether or not he actually needs them, it's clear that Hunter is in a bad situation. It seems that he relies on donations from Patreon, PayPal and other sites to survive, and doesn't appear to have any other consistent forms of income. He still talks about wanting to help others, and he claims that half of the money raised in specific Patreon tiers will go to help other people who are struggling. It's heartbreaking to watch the videos where he talks about his situation and sounds so defeated, and yet he never totally gives up hope. He has tried and failed to improve his circumstances many times, even flying to the UK in June 2014 to apply for political asylum, that this was rejected and he was detained before he returned back to the US. He stated that he only survived around that time thanks to the assistance of his friends. As for Hunter's family, the only relative he seems to be in contact with is his father, Dan. He has a whole section of his website dedicated to Dan, mostly criticising him, including email interactions and descriptions of conversations they both had. To briefly summarise, Hunter believes that his father is not doing enough to help him, and that every time he does try to help, there is an ulterior motive, usually to control or manipulate him with money. It's impossible to know for sure how accurate his portrayal of Dan is. I don't necessarily think Hunter is maliciously trying to slander him, but he's arguably not the most reliable narrator. He often seems suspicious and reluctant, not just regarding his father, but with other topics too. Some have suggested that he finds a problem with every solution. It's hard for me to have an opinion on that because I don't know every detail of his situation, only what he shares online, and it seems at least some of the content has been deleted over the years. Without knowing Dan or the history of the relationship between him and his son, I can't say for sure whether or not Hunter's criticism is fair, but from what I've seen, it does seem a little extreme. For example, in 2018, Dan offered to pay for a Housing First program for Hunter, a solution that Dan had apparently suggested in the first place after Hunter had initially rejected his proposal of a residential treatment facility. Hunter found a ranch in Morelos, Mexico, the country he was living in at the time. The ranch would provide access to assistance services such as laundry, cleaning and cooking, as well as equine-assisted therapy. Hunter accepted Dan's offer to pay for the program on two conditions. First, he did not want Dan accessing his medical information, and second, he didn't want Dan knowing the location of the ranch, and more importantly, his whereabouts. This information was shared on the website in the form of emails between the two of them. After this, Dan emailed the following to a therapist at the ranch. Hello, I am pleased to meet you. I send you a cordial greeting as well. I am hopeful you will be able to help and support Hunter. To understand how your house of assistance works, I will come to see your facility and learn about your therapy programs. We will discuss monthly payment at that time. Please choose a convenient day after April 12, 2018 when I may come to see you. 
My wife Donna will join me. She speaks Spanish. I hope Hunter will join us as well. I look forward to meeting your group. Kind regards, Dan. Dan also sent a copy of this email to Hunter, and Hunter replied with this. Dan Hogan and Donna, you don't get to buy control over me. You don't get to purchase any knowledge of my life. I specifically set a boundary. You cannot know anything about my medical care. You cannot purchase that information. You cannot abuse your power to cross my boundaries. You will continue to do it, just as you have committed multiple crimes in the past six years. I will not be going to the ranch. I guess I can understand that there may be reasons for Hunter not wanting Dan to access his medical records or something, but I don't think it's unreasonable that Dan would want to know the location of the ranch and to check it out himself before he paid $10,500 up front and then $4,000 monthly throughout the duration of the stay. Throughout the years, it seems that Hunter has expected financial help from his father in exactly the way he wants. He wasn't open to compromising and rejected any ideas Dan had that might actually improve his situation. After Dan's initial suggestion of paying for a residential treatment program, Dan refused this and stated that the only option he had to help him was by sending him money via PayPal. Dan emailed Hunter multiple times to tell him that the offer of a treatment program still stands, and every time, Hunter framed it as his father trying to control him. Again, I don't necessarily think that Hunter is maliciously slandering Dan, but from the interactions he shared on his own website, it really seems that his father is trying to help him, and for whatever reason, he's misinterpreting it as an attempt to control him. As already mentioned, Hunter does suffer with some mental health conditions, so it is possible that his suspicion and hostility towards his father is a result of these. Regardless, I think it would be fair to say that he has rejected opportunities that may have been very beneficial to him, which of course he has every right to do, but make of that what you will. That doesn't detract from the sympathy that I feel for his situation, especially if he's acting in a certain way due to mental illness, and I still hope he manages to get the type of help he wants so he can live a happier life. In order to understand what led Hunter to be in the difficult situation he's in now, let's take a look at a blog that was written to tell his story. The author of the blog is anonymous, but Hunter has confirmed that the details are accurate. He was born in Texas on the 2nd of June 1975 and was raised by his mother after his parents divorced. Apparently he changed schools at least once a year, and I wonder if this, along with the divorce, contributed to his opinion of his father. It certainly seems that he blamed Dan for the breakdown of the marriage. Nevertheless, he was an intelligent child and did well in school, and later majored in physiology and minored computer systems at Excelsior College. He then studied law in Chicago and eventually got his license to practice in Illinois. He was married for a brief, unspecified length of time and had two children, Anthony, who was adopted shortly after birth, and Storm, who stayed with her mother after the divorce. This is surprising to me because I've never seen him mention any children or his ex-wife. Granted, I haven't watched every single video he's ever uploaded or read every single post on the website, but it's interesting that he has a whole section of his site dedicated to criticising his father, and yet there doesn't appear to be any mention of his children. In February 2009, Hunter found employment in Carroll County, Illinois, where he worked as the only assistant state's attorney. It's crazy to think that less than 15 years ago, his life was going pretty well. He was an intelligent and successful man with a promising future ahead of him. He probably never even considered that just a couple of years later, he'd be living on the streets, with no money and no medical care, performing surgery on himself to post online and ask for donations. So what happened that completely turned his life upside down? Here's where things take an even darker turn. Although the assistant state attorney position had been a very promising opportunity for him, it is in fact what led to his downfall. 
A few months into the job, he decided to take on a case that the previous prosecutor had failed to handle properly. The victim was a 16-year-old named Justine who had been essayed and physically abused by her ex-boyfriend. A more recent article added that the case had something to do with inappropriate content, or CP. According to the blog, Hunter developed a friendship with Justine and her mother Naomi, but Justine soon became infatuated with him. He apparently asked to be taken off the case, and after his request was granted, the state attorney told him not to have any further contact with the family until the case was resolved. Sometime later, Naomi became ill and Hunter decided to visit her and send her a few texts wishing her well, and therefore broke the agreement that he had with the state attorney. Sometime, apparently after he had visited Naomi, he began a relationship with a 19-year-old woman named Karen. This wasn't any old Karen though, in fact he'd actually recently prosecuted her as a defendant. According to the blog, Hunter only spent time with Karen once, spontaneously, and kissed her goodnight, but it's implied that there was no further contact between them. However, the more recent article implies that there was more to it, and specifies that it was a personal relationship. When his boss found out, he told Hunter he had to resign or he'd be fired, so Hunter chose to resign, which was the beginning of the end of life as he knew it. After this, he rekindled his friendships with Naomi and Justine, but it didn't take long for things to escalate with Justine. One time when she was alone with Hunter in his apartment, they kissed and he touched her inappropriately. She was 17 at this time. The blog claims that he later admitted this to Naomi, intending for her to tell Justine that they could not have a romantic relationship but this blog seems to sugarcoat what happened and defends his actions. Naomi banned Hunter from her home and filed a complaint against him to the ADRC, who revoked his license to practice law. Hunter claimed that the only reason Naomi filed this complaint is because she wanted a relationship with him and he rejected her. After all this, Hunter began a full-blown relationship with Justine and actually moved in with her for almost a year. Justine defended Hunter's actions throughout and even wrote a blog post and uploaded a YouTube video claiming that she pursued him, not the other way around. This is pure speculation on my part, but I can't help but wonder if he manipulated her into saying that. I don't necessarily doubt that she was infatuated with him, but did she really make the first move, or was she groomed by him? I can picture a scenario where he initiated the relationship and told her to tell everyone that she'd pursued him, and she obliged because she didn't want him getting into trouble. It's not clear why Hunter and Justine no longer lived together after a year, but they still remained in contact for some time after. In January 2014, Hunter made a blog post on his site and posted a status on Facebook claiming that Justine was missing, quote, Multiple people told me that they had not heard from her and that they were worried about her. He stated that she was missing in action for her 21st birthday, despite her plans to start partying right after midnight, as soon as she was legally allowed to drink alcohol. Turns out she wasn't missing at all, and Hunter's false claims had angered her family. She later claimed that her phone was broken and she couldn't access the internet for a while, so she couldn't contact Hunter, even though all her friends knew where she was at the time. Justine deactivated her Facebook account because of this situation. I have no idea if Justine and Hunter are still on good terms, as far as I'm aware, he hasn't mentioned her on his website or YouTube channel in quite some time, and Justine's YouTube video and blog post in which she defended Hunter have both been deleted. I did find an archive of the blog. Here's an excerpt from October 2012. Hunter cried today. He cried because of a comment that he had posted on a Facebook update that he had posted a few days ago. He said... There is no way to clear my name. I like women. A few of them were 18. To society, I must have tricked them or coerced them or taken advantage of them. It makes me really sad that society is accusing Hunter of doing these things. 
It breaks my heart because looking back, the reason I wanted Hunter so badly was because I had been SA'd and all I wanted was for someone to be kind to me. When Hunter said, a few of them were 18, this implies that Justine and Karen weren't the only young women he'd had contact with. Presumably they were the only two that were relevant to his job, but he's making it sound like he had a habit of going after women around the age of 18 when he was in his late 30s. Justine goes on to talk about how kind Hunter was to her, how bad she felt when he left her life, that she was stupid for overstepping boundaries, and that she still blames herself for destroying his reputation and she'll never be able to forgive herself. I'm not making accusations here, but she's saying exactly the type of thing that a brainwashed grooming victim would say. It's really sad to read this. Her final post was on the 28th of May 2014, titled, Cruel Words, it read, You are turning our websites into weapons and the internet into a battlefield, but it would be foolish for me to allow the cruel words of one outweigh the shouts of many. Less than one month later, Justine apparently tried to get a restraining order against Hunter, then later claimed that she didn't. According to SorkValley.com In June, the woman sought an order of protection against Hogan in Whiteside County Court, according to court documents, but in an interview with Sork Valley Media over the summer, the woman said she never had sought that order. She said she knew who did, but wouldn't identify the person. So, make of that what you will, I guess. Regardless of who initiated this relationship in the first place, there's no denying that Hunter acted in a highly inappropriate and unethical way. He was 35 and Justine was just 16 when they first met. He was in a position of power and she was vulnerable at the time. Multiple articles state that he engaged in criminal conduct with Justine. I don't know if this is referring to what we've discussed already or something else, because although the age of consent in Illinois is 17, the circumstances are very different when the 17-year-old is the victim in a case you're prosecuting on behalf of the state. Still, one article mentions that the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission stated that Hunter's actions with Justine rose to the level of criminal conduct so it's possible that there are more details that haven't been made public. Let's not forget the 19-year-old he also had a relationship with, again, while he was in a position of power. Not that it excuses his actions if this was just a one-off, but it clearly wasn't anyway. It's possible there were many more, considering he said, a few of them were 18. Shortly after Hunter was disbarred, he made a post on his website in which he stated that he didn't commit a crime or ethical violation, and then, quote, Of course, because I am ashamed of my choices, I wish that all these events had stayed private instead of being spread to the four corners of the internet. Hunter saying that he didn't commit an ethical violation implies that he doesn't actually think he did anything wrong, and he's just ashamed that he got caught and lost his job. There isn't enough information to form a detailed timeline of Hunter's relationship with Justine, but I suspect that more happened between them while he was working on her case. They were clearly in a proper relationship after he resigned, as they lived together for a year. Perhaps they broke up after this, or had some kind of on-and-off relationship after, but I don't see any reason that they would have stopped living together if the relationship continued in a stable way, which makes it really weird that three years later he posted online claiming she was missing when she wasn't missing at all. I get the vibe that their relationship was turbulent, to say the least, and it's possible that he continued to manipulate her, perhaps even harass and control her, after they broke up. This is just speculation, of course. I don't know. It just wouldn't surprise me. Interestingly, a Blogspot user claiming to be Justine's sister commented on the blog that shared Hunter's story, clearly refuting the claims that Naomi wanted a relationship with Hunter and adding some worrying details about his time with Justine. Quote, 
Lol. My mother was very sick that summer. He claimed that she tried getting with him. I've seen the text. I don't see why she said she wanted to cheat on my father, who was overseas serving the country. I'm old enough to know Hunter is using what is known as flirting as her wanting the D. Which would never have happened. My mother was never that desperate. Hunter moved out of Justine's apartment due to the violence between them. Hunter laid his hands on my sister. Men should never put their hands on women. While he was living there, he shaved her dogs for no reason. He had to have her bathe him. He used all her money and laid on his fat ass doing nothing. Couldn't even get a job to help support her. Recently, she was crying very hard on the way to a Mallards game. I simply asked her, why are you crying? And her response was, Hunter makes me feel trapped. I just don't know how to get away. Maybe he needs to grow up, find a damn job, and quit finding reasons why he's in the wrong, not the right. Life moves on. Of course we don't know for sure that this really is Justine's sister. Anyone can say anything on the internet, but I don't find it particularly unbelievable. Her claim that Hunter shaved Justine's dogs is a very unusual and obscure accusation to make if this was just some random person making things up and trying to slander Hunter. These revelations paint Hunter in an entirely different light. He's not in the situation he's in right now through no fault of his own. He decided to abuse his position of power and have unprofessional, unethical, and highly inappropriate relationships with two different women who were both in a vulnerable situation. Now, I'm not saying that he deserves to be homeless or anything, but he acts as if his current situation is not a result of the choices he decided to make. If the comment from the user claiming to be Justine's sister is true, then Hunter has caused significant psychological and even physical harm to someone who he should have protected in a purely professional way. The case he was working on revolved around the past abusive relationship that Justine was in. He knew what had happened to her, and according to the Blogspot comment, he decided to put her through another abusive relationship. There's really no excuse for this. I didn't make this video to incite a witch hunt, and so I'll ask that you don't attempt to contact or harass Hunter. He clearly is not doing well mentally, and has even spoken about taking his own life. I don't want to be a contributing factor of that, and I'm sure you don't either, but I do think it's important that people know the truth. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any suggestions you might have for a future video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week in a new video.